John Hastings. I'm the Southeast Bridge Steel Specialist for the National Steel Bridge Alliance. I've been with NSBA for about three and a half years. Uh, I cover 11 states. Uh, Virginia down to Florida, over to Louisiana, and then Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Uh, prior to NSBA, I spent 24 years with the Tennessee Department of Transportation in their bridge design section. Uh, worked on most everything they do or design in-house, but I focused primarily on steel bridges. Um, did everything from road shapes to plate girders. Uh, these were straight, skewed, and curved. Uh, my largest bridge was uh, across the Tennessee River in East Tennessee. I had a 500 foot main span and the plate girders about 13 and a half feet deep. So with that, Steve, here we go. So I'd like to start the session today with some background on bridge cost. Uh, Michael DeGregorio, who is a construction estimating engineer with HDR in their Salt Lake City office, completed a comprehensive national uh, study of bridge cost, the assessment of new construction market pricing for steel and concrete bridges as shown on the right of the screen here. Uh, the conclusions reached by Michael came as a surprise to him as well as other bridge engineers. So the three primary conclusions are steel bridges are cost competitive, rolled steel beams are the most cost competitive and states typically exhibit a bias toward bridge types. So let's dig into the study and look at the project objectives. So the first was to determine the in-place cost of structural steel and precast concrete bridges. Uh, next, we're gonna break these costs down into subgroups, compare similar structures, and compare national and regional cost. The project scope of the report was to look at new and replacement vehicular bridges. Uh, the study only looked at what I would call typical bridges, so no trusses, no arches, no cable stay, no suspension bridges, and no widenings. And it covered a period of time from as early as 2011 to the second quarter of 2019. Uh, only design bid build projects by state DOTs were included, so there's no alternate delivery projects, which typically don't break the cost down into separate items. So examples of these would be design build or CMGCs. Those are typically let as lump sum projects. So the study included bridge projects from the 12 states shown in green on this slide. In the West region, we had Washington, Oregon, and Texas. In the central region, we had Minnesota, Illinois, and Arkansas. In the Northeast region, it was Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania. And last but not least, the Southeast region, we had Kentucky, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So for each of these states, bridge plans and historic bid tabs were collected for all their projects. So overall, approximately 730 bridges were obtained in these 12 states. So on the left side of this slide in the table, you will see the NSBA regions and the state. Uh, across the top, you will see the bridge type, steel or concrete, and then the date for those as well, and how many are in each calendar year shown below that. And then to the right of that, you have the total, which is given for those calendar years that were obtained from each state. Uh, 16 outliers were identified. These included railroad bridges, um, trusses, arches, a couple of pedestrian bridges, and one, I would call it kind of a unique structure, it was a plate girder, but it had a timber deck, so it was not included either. So once these outliers were removed, the study ended up with 714 bridges as shown in the bottom right corner of the table. And to my knowledge, there's never been a study of this caliber. So a complete takeoff was performed on each of those 714 structures. The items included the square foot cost, are included in the square foot cost consisted of mobilization, structural excavation, foundations, beams, and the superstructure or deck. A uh, quick note on mobilization, some states break that out. If they didn't, it was based on a percentage of the bridge cost to the total cost of the project. So the cost does not include an overlay, bridge rails, uh, approach slabs and aesthetics. Um, examples of aesthetics would be bridge lighting or other decorative items that had a separate item number. 
so they're trying to compare like structures and some bridges may not include these items or details very drastically between states. So the costs do include escalation factors to bring the cost to the second quarter of 2019. HDR used the uh, Bureau of Labor T Statistics, the producer price index, the engineering news record, and the construction cost index to make these adjustments. Uh, they also adjusted by location adjustment factor. In this case, they used RS means to fairly compare projects on a regional or national level. Uh, as you can imagine, a bridge in New York would not cost the same as a bridge in a more rural state. Uh, the key parameters recorded for each structure included bridge type, uh, span length by the largest span, skew angle, horizontal curvature, phasing, coatings, and the material grade. So five bridge types were selected. Uh, starting in the top right, we have steel plate girders. They're abbreviated as SPGs, rolled steel beams, RSBs, precast pre-stressed concrete I-beams, PPCIs, and then precast pre-stressed concrete boxes, PPCBs, and precast pre-stressed concrete slabs, PPCSs. So you'll see those abbreviations as we go through some of this. Uh, in order to compare like structures, HDR looked at the distribution of the span data and determined fan, or four span increments were appropriate. So a breakdown of the distribution is provided in the bar chart and the graph shown on the right of the screen. Uh, first, we have the short spans, which is everything less than 100 feet. It includes the steel plate girders, the road steel beams, the concrete eye beams, the concrete boxes, and the concrete slabs. Uh, next, we have what they call the medium spans, 100 to 150. Only included in it are the steel plate girders, the road steel beams, and the concrete eye beams. Uh, next up is the long spans, everything from 150 to 200. And then we have what they call the extra long, everything greater than 200. So shown on this slide is the distribution of cost by span length and each bridge is represented by a dot. So along the vertical axis you have the dollars per square foot and along the horizontal axis you have the maximum span length. So a lot of engineers and owners look at average cost which is represented by the red dashed line. Uh, the good news is half of the time they're high with their estimate. Unfortunately, the other half of the time, they underestimate their cost. And as you can see, the costs are all over the board. So HDR proposed looking at a range instead of an average cost. Uh, the range they proposed is the 25th and 75th percentile, which is shown by the upper and lower red dash lines. So the red shaded area represents 50% of the bridges. Uh, with this proposal, 25% of the bridges fall below this range and 25% fall above this range. I've seen a few states publish data or publish a range for their bridge cost data, but most uh, publish just an average in their bridge design manual. HDR then used the span data to further refine the ranges. Hopefully in the future, other bridge features such as skew, curvature, material grade, and corrosion protection systems can be used to further refine the data. But currently there just isn't enough data to be statistically significant. Uh, if you have an interest in looking at a state DOT that does split their stuff up by ranges, uh, check out Florida DOT's design manual. They break it up by simple and continuous spans as well as beam type, and I think span length as well. So now let's look at the national cost for all spans. So just to kind of orient you here, let me get the laser pointer. We've got all spans and you're gonna see national up here. Um, so these are the short through the extra long. It's all of these included in this chart. So costs are shown in dollars per square foot along the bottom of the chart. Different beam types are given on the left as well as the number of bridges in that type are shown in the parentheses. The blue dot represents the 25th and the 75th percentile, and the blue line represents 50% of the bridges. So the tighter the range, the more predictable the bridge cost. 
as you can see, there's a lot of overlap in the bridge ranges between the various bridge types, which shows that they are competitive with one another. The steel roll beams have the tightest range and are the most predictable. And the 25th percentile cost here is essentially the same for all beam types. So now if we look at short spans less than 100, the short spans, and this is still for the national data, we see that both plate girders and rolled shapes are competitive with precast concrete. Uh, roll beams still have the tightest range, which represents the most predictable cost. They also have the tightest range on the overall cost, which is shown by the gray dots and the gray line. And the 25th percentile is essentially the same for all beam types. In this table here, we're getting a more apples to apples comparison because we are breaking it down to those short span girders. So next for spans of 100 to 150 feet, which we call the medium spans, the concrete boxes and the slab bridges drop out. There was one box being found in this data set. Uh, road shapes are still found, but this span range starts pushing their limits. Uh, this was demonstrated in Dr. Mockelson's graph Wednesday, if you tuned in for his presentation. There's a lot of overlap in the cost ranges. Once again, showing steel girders are cost competitive. Uh, the steel plate girders and the concrete eye girders have essentially the same 25th percentile cost still there. So this chart is now looking at the central region and it's for all spans. So there is a lot of road shapes being used in this region and their price is the most predictable. There's also a lot of overlap between the steel and the concrete eye beams. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the boxes on the next slide. So this chart here is for Illinois and it's less for spans less than 150 feet. Uh, the boxes in this region all came out of Illinois. Illinois uses approximately an equal amount of steel and concrete girders. Uh, the 27 concrete boxes usually have only an asphalt overlay, which skews their results. Uh, they're typically, typically used on low volume secondary routes in Illinois, and the longitudinal joints between the beams typically show signs of leakage, which can cause issues with longevity. Uh, it's my understanding the system isn't allowed on primary routes, and according to the data in Illinois, Adding a slab to them would increase the cost about 40 to $45 per square foot. But if you look, the cost of steel and concrete I-beams is essentially the same here, and steel does have a lower median cost there. So if you'd like more information on the cost study, please reach out to your local bridge steel specialist. Uh, their contact can be found on the bottom here on the website with the URL shown, AISC.org slash NSBA. Uh, I know you heard some of this from Devin's presentation Wednesday, but I think it's important to repeat. For steel to be competitive, we recommend the following considerations. Um, utilize balanced spans when possible. You can refer to our continuous span standards at the URL shown. These uh, are for three span structures with center spans of 150 to 300 feet and girder space in seven foot six to 12. You can also accomplish balanced spans uh, with your end span set at about 75 to 80% of the center span. Also try to eliminate or reduce the number of piers to optimize the span arrangements. Our span to weight curves will help you make those decisions. They are also available for free on our website. These cover simple and continuous spans for various beam spacings. Uh, they were developed from cost-effective uh, conceptual solutions that we did in NSBA and cover spans from 50 to 450 feet. Uh, next, we recommend that you use wider girder spacings. Uh, it reduces fabrication, transportation, and erection cost. Uh, also balance the loads in those interior and exterior girders by setting your cantilevers at about 25 to 35%. Uh, we also ask that you optimize your web depths. Uh, you can do this in Simon. 
And that also uh, eSpan 140 will help aid in that. And last but not least, simplify those details. Um, I can't say that one enough. We see excessive bolts in field splices and cross frames all the time. We also see excessive welds at times. All of these drive up the cost significantly.